Welcome, everyone. Today's speaker is Professor uh, Rebecca Carl, a professor of, of history at New York University. Uh, she's the author uh, of, of many books, uh, and uh, I, I don't want to allow myself to indulge in uh, praising her scholarship or, uh, or giving much detail about her CV, because it would uh, just take precious time away uh, from uh, her presentation. The title of the presentation is The Socialist Law of Value and the Rural Economy, Wang Yanan and Marxism in China. Um, I want to thank Nathan for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll just dive in. This is work that I am presently in the process of uh, revising and putting together for a uh, monograph that may or may not come forth at some point. But the uh, set of issues that today I'm going to talk about is to try to think about what is a socialist economics, or rather how we can think the economic under socialism, how can it be constituted as a topos and an object of study. Now, if the question is asked merely as a problem of rapid growth and industrial modernization, as a question of strategies for achieving certain predetermined goals that can be counted and accounted, then of course the question of socialist economics or the economic under socialism is doomed to being an abortive historical problem, always falling short in relation to capitalist economics. That is socialist economics is a serious problem in the fields of socialism, anti-capitalism, and the economic, anti-disciplinary, can only be constituted as a problematic if we take it if, if we take seriously the fact that socialism is not capitalism manqué, and yet that it is also potentially trapped in analytic categories and historical contexts that somehow never could or did free themselves from their origins in classical and neoclassical economics. In this sense, socialist economics is an abstract question. How can, it help, how can it be philosophically constituted as something other than the particular economic strategies pursued by socialist countries such as China's? It's also a very concrete question. What practices helped constitute the economic in some historically existing version of socialism such as China's in the 1950s? To approach this question, one of the main problems I think that needs to be posed and considered has to be, what is the new socialist person, the Shihui Jui Xinren, if she is not the capitalist, ca classical and neoclassically posited economic person, the Jing Jiren, who is naturalized in most social and political economic theory from the late 18th century onwards. The question of socialist personhood clarifies that the economic can never merely be a question of economics, but rather, and obviously, it must be a question of sociality, history, and of culture. Wang Yanan, the economic philosopher and translator of Marx, uh, wrestled with this and similar questions, either directly or indirectly, from the late 1930s through the late 1950s. For him, the question of the economic in its abstract and concrete social relation to personhood was a philosophical and thus a historical and practical question. In its mo most concrete and yet also most abstract guise, Wang wrote many times in the 1930s and 40s on the problematization of economic person often by critically attacking Werner Sombart's assertion that capitalists are the masterful creators of social life and thus the ideal personification of personhood in general. This reification that conflates individual desire or pursuit with a systemic logic becomes entirely ideological and thus historically philosophical when economic value, jing ji jia zhi, and historical values, li shi jia zhi, become one through the transformation of the law of the jungle, the natural world, into the survival of the fittest, the human world. As Wang repeatedly said, this is just bad history. 
most important for the present purpose, as Wang sees it, the problem of value and values conflation becomes a key mechanism through which systemic logics are ideologically instantiated and materially substantiated through the narratively imputed individual history, uh, individual hero of history. The narrative is not the mere superstructural or representational form reflecting content. Rather, the narrative of the individual hero capitalist who creates capitalism as, the, as, a, as a naturalized system of human nature creates the content itself. If that narrative then is constituted through economics, then one major way of transforming the historical material conditions is, as Muang asserts, by correcting the irrational historical, uh, irrational economic relations among humans. What Wang calls for is a reconceptualization of the narrative that naturalizes some relations while denaturalizing others. So in, the, in this, the remaining part of this uh, talk or this presentation, what, I'm think, what I wanna think about is how narrative changes can be posed and posited, and thus how the value values conflation that leads only to mystification and alienation can be reoriented towards an exposition that provides a historical basis for a different kind of economic practice and thinking. These issues were seriously pursued in the thinking about and in Chinese socialism, thinking about and in Chinese socialism of the 1950s. They were never resolved and perhaps never could have been. The rural communes became the narrative center around and through which this new exposition was to be written. So uh, just to go back briefly uh, before I go to the 1950s, in the early 1920s, in the context of the socialist calculation debate in Europe, Ludwig von Mises, an anti-socialist and fervently anti-communist theorist of what came to be known as the Austrian School of Economics, declared that under socialism, and he was pointing here, of course, to the Soviet socialism then in formation, Quote, there would be no means of determining what was rational, and hence it is obvious that production could never be directed by economic consideration, unquote. For von Mises and his partner in debate, Frederick Hayek, this was a fatal flaw that doomed socialism not only to irrationality, but to impossibility. Working on the conceptual premise that the only mission of economics was the rationalization of production and consumption and circulation, socialism appeared to von Mises and to Hayek as an irrational rendering of social life that attempted to escape the unwavering laws of human nature. It's against this kind of imputed immu immutability that China's socialist economics was posed, particularly in the articulation of Wang Yanan, who had been a lifelong critic of the Austrians. And I've written uh, my, in, in my uh, 2017 book, Magic of Concepts, I've written extensively about Wang Yanan's critique of the Austrian school in the 1930s and 40s. In any case, in China in the 1950s, for Mao Zedong and the Maoist faction of the Communist Party, the problem of conceptualizing and realizing socialism was never merely a problem of economic considerations, even though the original five-year plan of the PRC conformed to the Stalinist urban first heavy industrialization policies that are most associated with the very socialist economism that became characteristic of Soviet competition with the capitalist world through the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yet by 1956 and 57 in China, at the end of the first five-year plan, a period of summing up experiences and learning from past mistakes ensued. In this process, not only were the economic achievements of the first five years of socialism in China tallied up, but even more consequentially, the very purpose of socialism, its social revolutionary goals was raised and redebated in light of, in light of the ways uh, China's economic achievements had fallen short of socialist ideals understood in non-economistic fashion. The law of value debate was joined at this time and is best understood as a process of trying to think about what a distinctive economics of socialism 
or socialist economics might look like. Certain participants in the debate took seriously the proposition that in socialism, the economic cannot be uh, analytically or otherwise separated from the totality of life itself. And through the debate, they attempted to think about ways to subordinate economic practice to that totality. The debate proceeded vigorously through 1959, although to the extent that the debate got bogged down into modes of counting or accounting, the problem became enmeshed in an insoluble conundrum of using separable capitalist categories to think socialism. And in those terms, the indivisibility of socialism became impossible to conceptualize. Hence, to the extent that the debate was forced into conceptual modes of profit, price, commodity, labor, and value as separable categories of counting, there was no escape from the narrow logic of the law of value as an accounting mechanism rather than a new form of sociality. Now, Wang Yanan attempted to circumvent that whole problem, and I'll discuss that in a moment because I cannot give a full account of the debate here. But nevertheless, several aspects of the process uh, we, have to, we have to grasp uh, very, very briefly. And it's generally understood that the 1958 publication and translation of Stalin's problems in Soviet social, uh, socialist political economy helped to animate the debate in China over commodity production, law of value, and other related questions. This text was published just as the communist wind, the Gunchang Feng, was beginning to blow, and the rural commune campaign was being launched. Mao Zedong made extensive notes in the margins of this book, in which he took great exception to Stalin's mechanical notion of how socialist economics should function. These notes were not publicly available at the time of the debates, although Mao's own interpretation of how socialist economics deviated from capitalist and from Soviet concerns had recently some, been summed up in his April 1956 essay, The Ten Great Relations, uh, The Ten Great Relationships, Lun uh, Shi Da Guan Shi. In 1959, a major conference was convened in Shanghai on the problem of economic theory, of socialist economic theory. The first of its kind in scope and reach, it was organized by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing in partnership with the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Held at Shanghai's Peace Hotel, over 240 economists and social scientists attended. It gathered together those who would continue the discussion of socialist economics that had begun in 1955 and 56, and that had restarted after the publication of Stalin's book. Xue Muqiao, Sun Yefang, and Gu Jun now are most associated both with the original discussion of Stalin's book and with this conference. Wang Yanan too attended the conference, as did practically everyone of any note in the field at the time. Whatever the merits of the various debaters or of the various debates, it seems generally agreed by scholars today that this was the first and, and last possible time under Mao that such a freewheeling discussion could and did take place. As is clear from the denouement of the debates, however, the terms in which the questions were posed became enmeshed in ideological intransigence and thus in political traps. It is un unclear to me how it could have been otherwise given the specific political and then tragic historical context in which the issues were battled out. Abstract questions raised with reference and in dialectical relation to the particular set of historical problems were quickly concretized in a fraught political context where the abstractions became simplified into operational categories. In this operationalization, the inseparable social and historical nature of the question of socialism was lost in application. Now, my own interest in these questions is not in endlessly rehearsing the minutia of the theories or the debates. Rather, my interest stems from my more general uh, preoccupation with Wang Yanan, which in turn emerges from my interest in how the problem of the economic was and could be constituted 
in different historical eras when what counts as economic practice is thrown into question. Now, this uh, uh, was, was uh, quite clear in the 1959 uh, uh, debates over what constitutes, what is particular about Chinese socialism, what is particular about socialism in China. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem then of uh, labor and the problem of profit could not be understood then in the same expropriative manner as under capitalism. That is, in the 1950s, and particularly in the construction and establishment of the communes, the problem of economics, what is the very terms of economic practice were thrown into question. As Isabella Weber has explored, the problem of output versus profit was one of the major issues debated between Chen Bodan and Sun Yat-fung from 1959 to 1964. And it's in the context of those debates that Wang Yanan uh, also intervened. Wang was most concerned in the late 1950s to denaturalize categories so as to re-embed them into newly emerging social formations. Thus, whereas somebody like Sun Yefang treated the law of value as an objective law of economics, Wang treated it as an embedded law in a specific social formation. For Wang, the question of the study of socialist political economy was a problem of epistemologically or conceptually specifying the scope of the object of study. He wrote that the study of political economics cannot be construed as a problem of objective existence or merely of policy or laws. In other words, the study of socialist political economy is a problem of practice in which all practices must be conceptually treated as fully embedded in social and cultural worlds that are not reducible to a singular logic of economics as a discipline of accounting or counting. As Wang clarified, the moment one tries to reduce political economy to a study of a singular object, a singular dui xiang, one reduces its potential for producing new conceptual forms from the emerging concrete socialist practices on the ground. This dynamic conceptualization had to take as its object then the newly emergent uh, uh, form of the communes. In this regard then, Wang in 1959 professed himself to be a partisan of what was called the social relations camp of the debate over the law of value against the forces of production camp of the debate. For him and from the perspective of this social relations camp, the problem of socialist economics could not merely be about which categories, laws, and structures could be enumerated as externalities to practice, but how categories of economic life were being created in socially transformed relations of production as internalities to social practice itself. That is, he was concerned with how practices of economic life contrib contributed to the establishment of a new social formation altogether, that is the rural communes, and how from within this evolving new social formation, new categories, new usages, and new relations would and could be elaborated. In a piece he wrote in January, 1959 for the People's Daily, for the uh, Remy Rubal, about the advent of rural communes, Wang noted that in the light of this new social formation, the expressive form and functional scope of hitherto existing economic laws had to be rethought. In this rethinking, one of the most important questions revolved around the relation of product, chanping, to commodity, shangpin. That is, the question was, if what was now produced in the communes should be properly understood as product and not commodity, or whether the product and commodity should be understood in some internally or externally related connection. Of course, the nature of the commodity economy was the major question raised by the rural commune form. It was on that issue that the whole law of value uh, debate hung. 
Nevertheless, Wang's position here is unique. As he articulates, the question could not be exclusively about circulation and price, that is, how value is realized either in circulation and exchange or in relation to price, unless one wished merely re to return to the problem of capitalist economics. Hence, in the, it is the conditions under which product, chanpin, is produced and allocated that has to become a question of and internal to the social relations of production, primarily, while the question of circulation and exchange is external and only secondary. In other words, it functions only with relation to its positional subordination in the new social formation. In this theoretical and material context, the problem of whether China's economy was socialist in a national sense necessarily intruded as an important consideration. Wang wrote, quote, the reason the commodified product remains necessary is because to a large extent, we still require the law of value to play a positive role in stimulating production and enhancing the social forces of production. To the extent that, uh, that unquote, to the extent then that China's socialist economy was unevenly national, or to put it differently, to the extent that the national economy and the socialist economy were not yet temporally or spatially uh, aligned, you had a mix of various kinds of economies at the time, and the socialist, the most advanced form of the socialist economy then was the rural commune. The law of value was required for the regulation of the productive and allocative relations between the uneven sectors and for the positive stimulation of sectors not yet producing and yet still stuck in producing, uh, not yet producing products, sorry, and yet still stuck in producing commodities. In other words, the production of commodities is the backward form and the pr producing of product of Chanping is uh, the more uh, advanced or uh, socialist form. With the problem of commodity production, a commodity circulation having been part, in part transformed into the product, uh, uh, the problem of product allocation. In other words, from Shangping Liu Tong to Chanping Fenpei, the mechanism of realizing value also had been transformed. It was no longer the old law of value that dominated Zhipei but the new law of value regulated through the new social relations in which the overall productive process was embedded. Thus, if one sees the late 1950s in a transitional frame as comprising layered elements of the new democratic mixed economy, old forms of semi-feudal and semi-colonial productive processes, socialism and communism, then commodity production remained a vestige of a previous mode and its operation, including the old law of value based in market exchange, remain part of the totality, but not in a determinative position. This was largely because the private profit motive was no longer extant under socialism. Thus the striving for price and market were no longer of primary concern and comparative sectoral advantage was not the logic upon which product was produced. Instead, the product was part of a totality whose end goal was not profit, but provision, gonging. Thus, rather than pertain to different sectors of the economy, the law of value positively regulated their, the, the uneven relations within a whole. This could clearly be seen, Wang says, through the rural communes. The most important point here is about the articulation of uneven social formations in a totality whose social logic has now been transformed. The mechanism or principle of potential transformation of unevenness will have been the rural communes as a new social formation whose integrated economies are not based on comparative advantage or profit, but on the provisioning of human life and the enabling of the emergence of the new socialist person. As Wang says, quote, all one needs to do is to participate even once in rural commune planning conferences to listen to how commune members sum up their discussions and convictions about the proportionate investments they make in farming, forestry, husbandry, sidelines, and fishery, 
in order to understand that in making certain decisions as a collective and in terms of the overall situation, they do not consider the law of value or comparative advantage in their allocations of resources and labor power." In other, unquote. In this situation, Wang concludes, the law of value is, quote, nothing more than the law of commodity prices that must be determined by the socially necessary amount of labor, unquote. Now, the problem of the socially necessary labor time complicates and also clarifies the matter. For some economists, such as Sun Yat Fang, socially necessary labor time was a form of calculation where the inspection and calculating required to account for efficiency turned the problem of labor into an economistic mode. Where abstract labor become, becomes a synonym to socially equalized labor as a mechanism of accounting. In Wang's terms, however, socially necessary labor time is a principle of social life, where the concrete problems of the reduction of wastage and the provisioning of communes turns the economic as practice <clears throat> into a problem of how to establish the rule of personhood over economics uh, uh, rather than the rule of economics over personhood. <clears throat> Sorry. Rather than just reducing value to labor, where labor is merely a countable unit of value, what Wang insisted was that value be derived from labor, that is, labor is value as a social form of the transformation of life itself. It is undoubtedly here, however, that the continued use of the law of value to regulate backward, that is, non-socialist parts of the economy, can and did get bogged down into the counting mechanisms. And yet, as Wang describes it, or attempts to save it for the non-determinative and yet important socially regulative function, the law of value must be thought as intrinsic to the foundations of the socialist economic system and the national planning system. In its internality, and because it is at the mercy of human intervention, rather than operating anarchically uh, or independently in the marketplace, it can function without threatening uh, to contaminate the non-capitalist totality of rural communes and their particular form of integrated social production and social life. That is, if the law of value is not cast in an, its accustomed capitalist narrative role as player in circulation and exchange, but rather is cast in a protagonist role as this primary exposition of the value of labor as a category internal to the new socialist formation of the rural communes, it cannot be threatening to socialist production, rather it contributes positively. By May 1959, the April conference was now concluded, the debate on the law of value moved into a next phase, and uh, Wang was uh, uh, very involved in that phase as well. So for him then, in enumerating the ways in which economists and commentators had hitherto uh, misunderstood the law of value, Wang clarified that socialist planned economy requires the law to increase labor power and to accelerate production. And yet still, he maintains that the law of value in socialism pertain, pertains primarily to the sphere of labor and production and not to the sphere of circulation and exchange. Wang is not concerned with what comes to be called in post Mao Deng's discourse, scientific management, but rather with the reduction of wastage in the overall economy and the stimulation of product that could help China cope with the necessarily self-reliant autocratic strategy of development imposed upon it by the global sphere. He is interested, that is, in labor as a form of social life and livelihood rather than a source of accumulation of surplus value. In general, what this position allowed Wang to argue was that the rural communes were an advanced social formation that provided the conditions under which the positive stimulus of the law of value could be fostered, while the negative attributes of such a law could be relatively negated. Wang uh, uh, argues this 
through a number of different essays that I will not uh, uh, go into. They are in a longer form of this uh, 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 presentation that uh, forms part of a paper that is to be published very soon. So what he argues, and here I want to note, of course, what lies in the background of the, the failure of all of this to actually grab hold of anything is the fundamental crash and crisis that happens in the Great Leap Forward and that, uh, that, that uh, informs the, uh, the, the, the famine and the, uh, the deaths of millions and millions and millions of, of Chinese uh, peasants and people. So I don't know, I cannot determine from the reading of or of anything that I have seen whether Wang is uh, aware in 1959 of this looming crisis. What I do know is that from, 19, from the end of 1959 to 19, the end of 1962, he stops writing altogether and presumably he stops writing because his abstract ideas of the commune uh, turn out to uh, bear no relation to what's actually happening on the ground. But what I want to uh, do is not to nostalgically look back and think about uh, what would have happened if Wong's abstract ideas had actually come to, come to be, but to try to uh, think about the realignment of economic production and sociality in the realm of economic thinking and socialist life and how uh, that was being thought as a philosophical economic and social problem at the time. Uh, and of course, one of the major problems was, I, I mean, aside from the looming famine and all the rest, which was of course a tragic uh, 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 historical outcome, but one of the major philosophical or, uh, or mechanistic problems inhered in how the communes were to interact with one another and with the uh, uh, planned economy. Now this, as we know, uh, broke down fundamentally. But it was here then that the logic of the law of value remains intrinsic to social, social and socialist production and is also externalized as a conscious tool of regulation. And here he analogizes the law of value and its function as part of a chess game or a go board, uh, ipanchi, right? with the mode of coordination not being market competition or profit-driven growth, but rather based in who can help uh, whom in an overall scheme of development. Now, there's to be, uh, to be sure, there's nothing in any of this uh, thinking that helps a technocrat understand what and how to count and where to find the proper, proper object, the guishang of accounting. If value is derived from social labor and is not an extrinsic, extrinsic measure of that labor, the unit of accounting is not evident. But that is due then in turn to Wang's own conviction that fully exploring and explicating conceptual issues is an intimate and intrinsic aspect of identifying any object of analysis. In other words, the object cannot become before the concept. The concept has to be derived from an object. So on the one hand, Wang dismisses singular explanations of development uh, and instead insists that it is only the dialectical interaction among and between relations and forces of production that provides the momentum for transformation and accelerated development. And on the other hand, in the specific context of socialist China of the late 1950s, there are still huge gaps and thus enormous unevenness in the overlapping modes of production still extant in social life. Whereas in capitalism, unevenness is an obstacle to transformation or put differently, whereas capitalism's purpose is to continuously reproduce unevenness and thus lock into place the unequal relations of time and place or space so as to better accumulate. By contrast, in socialism, this unevenness is the very condition for the enabling and promotion of social transformation. Thus, in the rural areas, the coexistence of, of, of different forms, whether 
cooperatives and communes promotes the transformation of all into the more socialist form as their non-antagonistic contradictions lead to the process of quantity change turning into a change in quality. In other words, the way in which unevenness operates in socialism is progressive and it serves to stimulate transformations in social relations, whereas in capitalism, it is regressive and only serves as a principle of capital accumulation. And so for Wang, it's the emerging rural communes that provide the socially transformative principle on, upon which socialism as a generalized form of human life and personhood will have been articulated. Meanwhile, it is the law of value as embedded in the emerging socialist forms that allows and forces different levels of formations to interact in a totality whose logic is no longer the production of capitalist profit, but rather the promotion of socialist provision. Now, as I said, we all know the consequences of the Great Leap Forward and the enormous suffering that that entailed. The fact of the famine, of course, precluded the subsequent revisiting of any serious further consideration of socialist economics as a form of non-economistic social practice rooted in provision rather than profit in socially transformed relations of production rather than in the primacy of the forces of production. By the 1980s, when the debate over the law of value was rejoined in the context of post mal reforms, the logic of the party and of social practice already had been transformed. The return in the early 80s of such economistic thinkers as Xue Muchao and Sun Yat-fang and Gu Jun, among others, can be considered good indicators that economics as a science of capitalism was poised for a comeback. The whole question of socialist personhood was thoroughly mutated into the demand that everyone perfectly embody economic personhood, thus short-circuiting alternatives to economistic and predict productivistic lo social logics and social processes. So saying is not meant as a nostalgic reach for a lost past that could have been different. It is merely to indicate that the extended decade of the 1950s debates about socialism were perhaps some of the most consequential theoretical and practical discussions there could have been on the potential of a socialist economics or an economics of socialism. Revisiting those debates is meaningful for understanding what at that time was perceived to be in the realm of the possible and how fully the reality fell short. And um, I think I'll end there. Uh, thank you very much for this extremely uh, interesting and uh, rich talk. So value is socially necessary abstract labor time. And, and then I'm interested in the abstract there where in, uh, you know, in the first chapters of, of Capital, Marx talks about the kind of the, the relationship between concrete uh, labor and abstract labor, uh, which I understand as coming into being through uh, competition in the commodity and labor market. And uh, the sort of, you know, the, the, the transformation, if you like, of concrete labor into abstract labor. And whenever I hear about, and I don't, don't know this literature very well, but um, the law of value under, under socialism or under any kind of non-capitalist mode of production, I, I wonder about the, the mechanism of, of mediation between concrete and abstract labor. And I wonder if that's something, I don't know, that, that was, was an issue in these debates in the 1950s. Sure, yeah, uh, that's the wing of the debate I don't deal with. Um, <laughs> that's the wing of the debate, the debate that continues to count labor as uh, a, a unit of value rather than the value of labor as, as embedded in social forms. Um, and so, uh, I mean, obviously at some point in order to have a functioning econ economy, and to have the technocrats who run that economy, there, there, there has to be units of accounting. And that's where the, what Wong is saying, that, that's, that's where the translation doesn't happen. In other words, the, the philosophical concern with 
how to think of socialist economics with capitalist categories or categories that are derived from capitalist uh, histories and capitalist practices, that becomes the insoluble problem. Uh, because if, if one is going to continue to operate in a neoclassical, classical or neoclassical economic categorical universe, it is very hard to break free of precisely these kinds of mechanistic questions that require one to count, account, mediate, and so on. And so what he's trying to do, what Wang is trying to do is think uh, about how under uh, the, uh, the, the problem of socialist labor as provisioning, rather than as the, uh, the, the, the extraction of surplus value, how the provisioning, uh, gonging, is going to uh, realign uh, concrete and abstract labor. In other words, there is no longer a, 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 a gap. There's no longer that, 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 that difference between concrete and abstract labor. Uh, if one thinks labor as the value of creating livelihood and creating personhood rather than personhood creating value. So I, I, th that's the best I can do there because, uh, but people like Sun Yafang, Chen Muqiao, Gu Jun, and many, many others. I mean, I have a huge tome of this, these 240 economists and, and social scientists who arrived at the Peace Hotel at the Ho Ping Fan in, 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 in Shanghai in 1959 to uh, debate out these questions. And there, you know, a full 235 of them are trapped in precisely going round and round in these circles. And five of them are trying to think something else, <laughs> OK? Uh, so that in reading through, and they're vigorous debates. It's not like everybody who's, who's, who's thinking the same uh, set of problems is thinking the same thing. I mean, Sun Yafang uh, comes out on the very wrong end of this, I mean, politically wrong end of this at that time, although he comes out on the politically correct end of it uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, when this gets re rethought, but yeah, they these are these are um, uh, you know uh, Wang Yanan was a translator of Marx Capital One Two and Three, so he's uh, intimately familiar with Marx's discussion of these things. And what he's trying to do is think his way out of the capitalist traps. Uh, he doesn't succeed in. Uh, I mean, I think that he's provocative for that reason, and the reason I'm interested in him is because he refuses to subordinate his philosophical thinking to party dictates. But, uh, uh, but by the same token, it's not practiced economy. It's not practical. Uh, last night, I was reading um, uh, the, the, the Poverty of Philosophy. And Engels has a nice um, uh, introduction where he's complaining about Rodbertus. And, uh, and Rodbertus is, is is doing is doing this apparently uh, using tr trying to come up with socialist economics using uh, bourgeois you, you know political economy categories by basically saying we 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 should try and find uh, you know a, a a way to make the law of value work without uh, exploitation yeah and um, and and it, what was funny to me was it, it seemed actually a lot like a like uh, like like sort of Austrian style critiques of of socialist planning, where Engels says, you know, if you if you try and do that, then everything will have to go, you know, because you lose the market as the mediation between concrete and abstract value. You'll have to do it through uh, sort of uh, central planning by the state, and that will interfere with people's freedom and will lead to, you know, shortages and. <laughs> I was amazed, like, oh, this is Engels talking, right? Um, and it and it sounds to me like that's it, um, maybe not, maybe not in those concrete terms, but uh, that that's sort of you and and Engels and uh, Wang Yanan are maybe all saying that the 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 trouble is once you have a revolution, you need to stop trying to use uh, uh, capitalist economic categories <laughs> in your analysis of of what you're trying to do in socialism well 
I mean, and, and, and Wang was, as I tried to indicate in my uh, discussion, I mean, he's very clear that that, that China presents not a, a, a full, uh, the national economy of China is not even, it's not evenly a socialist. It is very unevenly socialist, in fact. And it could very well be that way for a very long time. And therefore one has to use different conceptual categories for different kinds of things. But if one is reaching for socialism and not reaching for capitalism, then one has to reach for philosophical and conceptual uh, uh, formulations that don't merely repeat capitalist uh, desires and capitalist uh, narratives. And so he's not saying that uh, you know all of a sudden, 10 years after the revolution, China should be fully socialist and, uh, and everything should be abolished. That, he's not saying that at all. He's trying to rethink what the, I mean, as we know, unevenness in, in, in Marx or as, as, a, as a problem of capitalist uh, development is the premise upon which capitalism works, right? Is the creation of unevenness so as to be, uh, to, 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 to further accumulate. Um, you know, people like David Harvey and so on have, 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 have discussed this as a spatial fix, whether one believes it's a spatial fix or some other, you know, the Rosa Luxemburg crisis of over accumulation, whatever it is, right? There you, uh, colonialism as, you know, whatever, you know, these are all familiar categories and familiar uh, notions. So that for him, he's very clear that unevenness in capitalism is regressive. It holds uh, places back. It holds people and 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 locations in thrall to the domination by capital. But his understanding of social of unevenness in socialism is entirely different because there is unevenness in socialism, especially in China socialism in 1959. You have these very advanced forms, which are the communes. And then you have regressive forms, which are, even though things are being nationalized already by the 1958-59 nationalization of private property and so on, you do still have private profit, private property, private, and, 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 and various forms of production and accumulation that are not yet subordinated to the socialist principle. And so for him, the question of how to transform those sectors of the economy or those sectors of production uh, into uh, a socialist forms is premised upon the unevenness where you have the advanced forms that will drag along and finally pull out of their capitalist backwardness will pull along you know, other sectors of the economy. Um, obviously, the, none of this had enough time to work before it all crashed. Um, and uh, you know, so so yeah, it's um, not clear that there's there's there there was an answer at that time or at any time to this question. It's just that he was not uh, uh, he was not a fan, as was as uh, Mao was not a fan of the anarchic marketplace as being the mediator of economic uh, life. So in Mao in in 1959 makes very clear that the uh, that 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 the, the market has to be under the command uh, under uh, politics and command right to use a phrase <laughs> this is part of a larger uh, 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 set of uh, of um, writings that I've been doing on Wang Yanan and these critical moments, 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, when the problem of the economic had to be rethought. So the 1930s in the context of the global depression, the 1940s in the context of the of total war, and the 1950s in the context of uh, uh, the transition to socialism. At each point, what constitutes economics, not as a disciplinary practice, but as a social practice, had to and was rethought very fundamentally. And so at, at each point, there were huge debates uh, that Wang Yanan was central to in many ways. So I've been trying to um, 
think through the uh, these this periodicity of debate uh, from the and and of course the logic of concepts which I published in 2017 uh, deals with the 1930s, 40s, 1980s, 90s comparisons. So I thought I would go back and do um, a, a more embedded 30s, 40s, and 50s consideration, which is uh, what this is part of. Uh, something that I think is really one of the most elegant features of Capital as a, as a, as a book yeah, across the three volumes is that he starts with his own presentation of, you know, this is how I think uh, the capital system works. And, and then through a very elegant progression, you see how the bourgeois understanding uh, emerges out of that. Yeah, so it's a nice sort of historical materialist understanding of, 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 of bourgeois ideology. Uh, and, and in particular, the, you know, the Trinity factors of production form, right? But the marginal revolution hadn't, hadn't happened yet. Uh, and then I think most Marxists I run across just see the marginal revolution as, as kind of basically, the the second international was getting powerful and scary, so they had to you know do some really kind of uh, kind of I, I don't know say um, coarse apologetics and get rid of value from uh, from their economics and and that doesn't to me that doesn't seem like a very good account like there should be a way of sort of keeping with you know Marx's project of saying like why marginal utility is a sort of necessary development of, of, of bourgeois ideology, yeah? And, um, and I'm just wonder in his, in his uh, engagement with the, the, the popularity of uh, marginal utility types in China, did, did Wang Yanan have any account of why this is happening? Well, I mean, his account of why it's happening in China is a is 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 a non-account. It's really just these are all these are these are these are comprador disciples of you know shitty econ economics economics you know from elsewhere, and yeah. they're just you know uh, ideologically bulldozed into this because it seems uh, closest to the common sense common sense. Uh, so that you know his 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 dismissal of its adoption in China is very very um, is 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 very uh, offhand and I, I mean he he doesn't minimize how what a grip it has but he does minimize what uh, you know he doesn't think about it in terms of a narrative of you know why this at this point um, his his. His critique of Austrian school more generally, and why it uh, is and is is wrapped up in its uh, relationship to uh, the German New Historicism, which he equally despises. Okay, and so that uh, he 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 thinks both of these are uh, are are, and that he 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 pins these to uh, the idea. Strangely, I guess, or not so strangely, that these are uh, in Europe backward economies that need to think their way out of backwardness into uh, into something, and that these are and that these are mechanisms, whether it's new historicism in the national economy, nationally uh, nationalist economies like with Friedrich List or so on, or it's um, the Austrians. That these are backward economies that need to uh, think their way through and out the other side of of of, of their backwardness. Um, I don't recall exactly. I mean, it's been several years now since I read him on the Austrians, and I wrote. I you know I I, I, I often I've I've given talks about the uh, magic of concepts in various places. And people ask me specifics about the Austrian school. I said everything I know about the Austrian school is in that chapter. I don't. Okay, I don't yeah. independently study the Austrian school of economics, so that you know I, I'm not an economist and I don't independently study it. But uh, the uh, the 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 problem of the Austrian school uh, for for Wang is that it conforms to a certain kind of uh, of in in a so-called backward economy, 
where you don't have the mechanisms of imperialism or of imperial control and of colonialism, or those are not the major mechanisms through which capitalism has advanced, what you have are individual heroes who can go forth and 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 you know and and fulfill their desires, and so that it comes out of a national backwardness. Yes, of course, it failed miserably, and uh, yes, and uh, as I said, I, I Wang Wang Wang's Wang's and and everybody Sun Yafang and Xue Muqiao and so on, all of them go silent from 19, from the end of 59 until 62, 63. And so uh, one has to take this silence as either having been politically silenced or just being horrified at what's going on and therefore having very little to say um, about it in, in the terms that are uh, discussed. By the time you get back from uh, the disaster, what, uh, by the time people start, start re-engaging uh, the question of economics, you're into what the historian Morris Meisner has ta uh, talked about as being the Thermidorian reaction to the, uh, to, to the Great Leap. In other words, the uh, return to uh, certain kinds of private, uh, private uh, profit and, and so on. And those are re-theorized. And so the commune, yes, the commune is heavily theorized through the 1960s and certainly through the 19, uh, 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 through the Cultural Revolution until it's disbanding in the 1970s, the late 70s and so on, the communes then become re-theorized as failures, as abject and absolute failures, no matter whether they actually had some efficacy or not. They, they're, they're, they, they are abandoned, of course, as a social form. So yeah, sure, Chinese economists have taken up uh, the commune form uh, repeatedly, uh, specifically, most recently in the uh, debates, uh, Wen Tianjun and his debates over, over rural reconstruction and so on have uh, revisited commune, um, the communes as social forms. So sure, yeah, there's a ton of, of, of uh, economic work, uh, work from economists on that, for sure. <laughs>